<laughs> so, um, you know, first of all, I would like to thank you all for educating me. For educating me. I just was having a conversation with a gentleman. He was telling me about um, the killer fog in London. And, you know, most of you all had, have had this disease, COPD or asthma, for, you had it before I was born. So, every time I see somebody who comes to the clinic, they end up teaching me something. And, um, you know, li Libby Amphibole, for example, I've never heard of it. And I met a patient and they said, do you know where is Libby Montana? I said, no. You don't know where is Libby Montana? Do you know about Libby Amphibole? I said, no. I was making notes in the other way. I said, I read about Libby Amphibole and turns out they have a whole center of asbestos related disease in Libby. So the next patient who came in, I showed off. I said, oh, looks like you have the Libby amphibole. So, whoa, how did you know that? <laughs> so, now I know uh, killer fog from London. So, next time I have somebody from Europe who is around 60 years of age, because my, my friend here told me about um, the killer fog, which, you know, which always brings to me a topic. Most of, most of you have had, how many of you have asthma? Okay. And how about COPD? Okay, how, how many of you have had this disease related to smoking? Okay, so, you know, my, I have almost, what, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. I have two options. I can, I can give you the didactics, you know, or I could take questions and then see what exactly are you, because you've had this disease for a long time and you are here attending the seminar because you either have questions or you are looking for updates. So, if you have any questions, I can take the questions and then I can start building the talk on that. <coughs> or I could go straight up so that I just, I really want to know if you have any questions so that, you know, those questions, you know, they don't have simple answers. They need, uh, they need a lot of explanation. And I, and I don't want to rush into those answers. So, regarding diagnosis, the treatment, upcoming modalities, what else can be done? If you have any questions that I can direct the talk to, otherwise, you know, I think Catherine has probably talked to you guys before about asthma, uh, COPD in various, uh, you know, presentations. Uh, asthma, COPD is not something specifically which pulmonologists manage. You know, the primary care manages it family practice manages it, <coughs> urgent care manages it, ER manages it. Um, so, um, if you ha guys have no questions, I'll, I'll start. But if you have any questions, feel free to stop me anytime uh, during the presentation. The the yes. So, yes, it is inflammation. It is it's essentially a response of your body to inflammation, to, to, uh, to a agent. It's almost like, um, you know, you, it could be from allergens. You know, younger people, they, they have, you have a tendency to hyperreact. Your body has a tendency to hyperreact. So, an allergen comes in and normally, if that allergen comes to me, it hits me and it says, ah, don't worry about it. You know, I was gardening the other day. I, I never knew until I came to Tri City that there's, you could see pollen. Everything comes. So, what is this yellow dust? <laughs> I was very happy I did not have asthma, right? Because I was, I was in the middle of it. So, then the pollen comes to me, and my body says, That's okay. You know, it's just a pollen. Don't worry about it. But somebody like you, who's, who's sensitive to it, the pollen goes in and goes like kids in, you know, middle school, ah, and it, your body goes completely haywire, and then your body does not stop. It does not know how to stop. It keeps on going, and just, it's a cascade of inflammation, but this kind of inflammation differs from different kind of asthmas. So we have different kind of white cells. One is eosinophil, and one is, you know, neutrophils. In asthma, you have eosinophils, which go up, and that's why, you know, our respiratory system starts from here. Some people start having runny nose, 
itchy eyes, and then slowly, slowly, if they don't stop it, it's going to go to the lungs, and then your lungs are inflamed. If you do something about it there and then, you know, your and how, how do your lungs respond? They know something is coming in, and all they knew is to how to shrink, right? So that's the normal airway right there. This is the normal airway. You have the smooth muscles, okay? And now here is your asthmatic airway, which the only way it knows is when you have an attack, it just shrinks and it has muscles. Now you see bodybuilders, right? If they do this too much, they get big muscles. So if your asthma attacks become more consistent and you don't do anything about it, right? you develop muscles and when you develop muscles your airways become more and more thicker so the root cause is inflammation that is why the difference between asthma and copd is in asthma we bring the anti inflammatories the inhaled steroids way earlier if you have so we we divide asthma based on how frequently you need albuterol if you need once in a while, we just leave it. That's okay, just manage it like that. If it becomes more frequent, then we start you on inhaled steroids. Why? Because we are working on controlling the inflammation. If I control the inflammation, I don't need the bronchodilator. The albuterol's job is to bring this back to that, so you're breathing back normal. But if you do, if you do that often, you know, your, your muscles would get used to it. The respiratory muscles would get used to it. They would be like, you know what, I forget about it. I'm, I'm used to this thing. So we have to work on the inflammation aspect. And to uh, answer your question you had asked in the previous that, you know, uh, that you do, um, I'm, I'm, do you have more questions? Let me finish yours. What makes you cough more? Yes, so asthma presents as cough. The, the main symptoms, if you see, are wheezing, which is tight airway. When you breathe, no sound, wheezing. Then you have cough, which is, again, your lungs telling you there is some irritant. But the irritant went away. You, you were done with that pollen. When you were out, you came inside, but your body is still in that phase. So when the lungs, when the airways are tight like this, you want to open them so that the air can come in and then you go out of where your stimulus is and then the cough is going to be definitely the problem. So the treatment for that cough is not going to be a cough syrup. The treatment for that cough is going to be, the idea is prevention. Now how do I prevent, uh, if you love gardening, I'm not going to say stop gardening, you know, I mean, you have, to, you have to do your garden, but now you know what triggers your symptoms, right? So one of the things we do is called a specific Northwest panel. We check you for all the allergens which are there in, 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 in Pacific Northwest. So now we know that these are the allergens, you can avoid that. Now you're allergic to cats and dogs. Like my friend there, she has, she's, uh, let's say she's allergic to cats and dogs. Now, you know, I have a dog, right? and uh, I love him, I cannot get rid of him, but it, it's just me. There are people who say, you know what, uh, uh the dog is going out, I don't want it. But there are some people who are attached to their dogs, so what I asked them initially to do is, that's fine, you keep the dog, but he does not have to sleep in the bed, right? That is something that is not inhuman, because if the, you know, dogs, my dog sleeps better in his crate than on the bed. Because when, when are you most active? You're active during the day, you don't meet the dog all day. But when you go back home, you know, you do the, you know, the petting part of it, and then when he goes to bed, he goes to his own place. Because when you're sleeping, you're relaxed. You're taking deep breaths in and deep breath out. So that is when your, the, the allergen goes up high in your, uh, in your room. So, you know, that is one thing. Because the air purifier, right, that's perfect. You get your air purifier, you get your essential oils. I cannot say anything about herbs because I have no experience. But, you know, if it works for you, it, it's as long as it does not harm you. For example, you know, if, if it's not a volatile oil, which you're, like essential oils, you know, you rub them, perfect. You put them under your tongue, perfect. But if you start putting them on a heated filament and making fumes, 
and that goes into that is wrong because then what's going to happen is I did a bronchoscopy once on a person who was doing that and they did not tell me they had big <laughs> lymph nodes when I biopsied them black oil came out I have pictures okay go ahead I do doTERRA too. I, I do for my massages. I do doTERRA. It's good. Those are, as I said, you know, because you mentioned, uh -huh, go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask you, if a person has inflammation throughout the whole body. What is, uh, inflammation, okay. Inflammation, meaning you're talking about the lungs, but if they have it in the body through like arthritis or anything like that. Right. So, asthma-like symptoms, yes. <coughs> Rheumatoid arthritis, for example, it can produce exactly the same symptoms like asthma. And that is, you know, uh, in fact, I have a 27-year-old a, a girl who just got a lung transplant because she was managed as asthma forever. And it turns out she had what is called as respiratory bronchiolitis obliterans. And the only way we knew it is, so these are, these are the features you want to look for when you're seeing asthma, right? One is episodic. You have symptoms one day, next day you don't have it. If anybody says, you know, doc, I have these symptoms and one day I'm feeling so good and next day, oh my God, I feel terrible. That's episodic. Characteristic triggers, right? So inhaled allergens, so you have the indoor allergen, dust mites, animal danders, molds, mice, cockroaches, um, food allergies that they ask, you know, that I'm, I'm allergic to fruits. That usually does not cause asthma-like symptoms. I mean, you can have, if you have severe allergy, you can have swelling of the throat, which can lead to wheezing, but that usually not uh, gives you the symptoms of asthma. And, you know, um, uh, respiratory in, uh, uh, irritants, cigarette smoke, okay, wood smoke. Uh, from that's why I always like to ask, you know, and and again, thanks to you, I've seen beautiful places around here just because I knew. Well, have you been to Joseph, Oregon? Yes. Well, you should visit there in winter. You see how cut off that is. I went to see there, and I went and I saw all the places. And I did realize they are, they are still, a lot of people are using wood smoke. And then when I lived in that cabin and I burned the fire, I was like, you know, I, again, I'm glad I don't have COPD because the amount of smoke is, is an irritant. That's why, you know, m when my neighbor is having smart people, what they do, my neighbor is having barbecue, I stay inside. When there is fire, I stay inside. It was cold outside, I stayed inside. Again, going to how you prevent the allergy, uh, the, the irritant. Um, now, when do we think that you don't have asthma? And, and this is my concern because now we are shifting a lot of care to um, nothing against urgent cares, right? But, you know, prednisone, for example, uh, one of the, you asked that can, in, uh, no, I think the gentleman left. He asked if inhalers work for people with 
interstitial lung disease or fibrosis. You know, smoking causes interstitial lung disease. Smoking causes pulmonary fibrosis. Smoking also causes COPD. And people with COPD can have allergies and they can be asthmatic. But when you go to an urgent care and they tell you, well, looks like you have asthma. Here, take steroids, take inhalers, and then you go on your way. You feel great. You feel great with the prednisone for five days. Then you feel great on the inhalers, but then the symptoms come back. So by the time we get to see you, you have had, um, you come with five inhalers, and I have a, I have a, <coughs> this is where, this is where they have to choose from, right? It's like, but then, you know, there is a, there is a, there is a science behind it as to which patients, which patient gets what. So, here, so when do we think that this patient has asthma or not? One, onset to symptoms after age 50. You may have asthma after age 50, but my job is to rule out everything which can mimic asthma. When I was young, I had a biking accident. I was, I don't even remember, I was a long time back, I, just, I'd, I heard here, but after that I've always had this voice and now I'm wheezing. Turner, he had an injury to trachea, now he has a scar tissue, which was being treated for asthma. Second, do you have any other symptoms? Chest pain. So, if you have chest pain and you have so of signs of wheezing, then we have to figure out, is it really asthma or not? Concomitant symptoms, chest pain, lightheadedness, syncope, you know, all these are uh, pulmonary vascular disease, like Dr. Cayetano said about pulmonary hypertension. Because what happens is you have the airway, the blood vessel, the artery and the vein, they are all in a small tight loop, okay? What happens is, and there's a constant fight, you know, move, 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 like in the bed, right? They are just moving, you know, you're not getting enough, enough space. When your blood vessels are all full because of high pressures, they compress the bronchi. So what you do is, <laughs> you take albuterol, it's not helping because it is being compressed by the blood vessel, but what is this going to do? It's going to increase your heart rate. So you tell me, you know, I use albuterol, I don't feel good. I don't feel any relief. That's a sign we are not treating asthma or, uh, well, we'll stick to asthma. History of smoking. Again, this is, this is very important because, you know, you go to a, I'm going to use cardiologists because, you know, they're my friends. But you go to the cardiologist's office and say, I'm short of breath. I just don't feel, do you smoke? Uh, yeah, I, was, I quit in 1980. I mean, well, yeah, 1980. That's your lungs. That's your lungs. Go to your lung doctor, <laughs> right? And you go to the lung doctor. He does a lung function test. You know, I don't see anything abnormal in the lung. And the patient sitting there, you know what? Why is this moderately reduced diffusing capacity? So one of the things which I have to always tell the patients is it is never alone the lung. It is never alone the heart. Heart and lungs work like a horse and a carriage. You need to have a good carriage for the, the, the horse to be effective, and the horse has to be good so that the carriage is effective, right? If both of you tell, you know, there's something wrong, and now, now here's the patient saying, I, my carriage is not working, nothing is working, I cannot go and do shopping, they won't work, and, and the horse guy is saying the horse is okay, and the cart guy is saying his cart is okay. So then is, then is the part where we have to do some more investigation. So, huh? 20 pack years. 20 pack years. So, with, with, uh, with people who have more than 20 pack years, and we calculate pack years from a day of the one pack a day is one pack a day for a year is, um, you know, one pack year. Two packs a day is two pack years. And often, when we ask the patient, uh, how much do you smoke, sir? I smoke 10 cigars a day. You okay? And then when you go back, say, what is the maximum you smoked? Oh, don't worry. When I was working in railroads back in Baker City, I used to go three packs. Like, oh, what happened? Yes, ma'am. I wanted to ask you, you guys talk a lot about reflux. 
Yes. And um, the long, why? Because I have three questions that. Okay. That's so much. So, <coughs> irritant, right? We blame our dogs, we blame our cats, we blame the pollen, but nobody blames the food. Nobody blames our eating habits. You know, if you look up my reviews, I, I love to read my reviews. It's like those stars reading their, uh, their, their tweets. Somebody wrote, this doctor is useless. He talked to me about food. What does food have to do with my breathing? He should have focused on my breathing. Because our lungs and the trachea and the esophagus, they are like this, right? So when you are full of acid, and this acid, I mean, this is the acid which dissolves and digests the steak you eat, right? And I'm talking about the muscle of a cow. Trachea is like nothing in front of this acid, right? So now you're laying down and you have acid reflux, so the acid comes and goes into your trachea. What do you think that acid is going to do to your trachea? Burn. It's going to burn it, right? And when it burns it, it is inflamed. Now what happens is, you, now you're burning from this trachea and that you don't do anything about it. It keeps going on deep, deep, deep and causes pulmonary fibrosis, number one. Number two, asthma is going to make your asthma worse. Your asthma is sensitive. You're giving acid to your lungs. Now your asthma is, now what happens is, now you start coughing. You cough, cough, cough. How do we cough? <gasps> <coughs> when you take a deep breath, you create so much pressure, more acid comes. So then it's a vicious circle. More acid, more GERD, more reflux. So you have to stop it somewhere. So you treat the inflammation, you treat the acid reflux. If acid reflux is the only cause of your cough or asthma, you treat both. Once I'm assured that your acid reflux is confirmed or treated, then we can back off on the asthma medications. And we've had, high, we've had people with uncontrolled asthma forever, and all they needed was a hiatal hernia to be fixed, and that's it, off all inhalers, and then they don't see me ever. So that was for the reflux. <laughs> That's okay. It'll come back. It'll come back. That's why you should write it down. <laughs> so, you know, the whole, whole point of treating asthma, these are, these are points, you know, you have it in the printout. Uh, the whole point of asthma is to get quality of life, right? And quality of life means you are able to do what you can safely, because if you say that I'm short of breath, uh, when I walk and I tell you, just stop walking, That's, I'm done, right? Good. I mean, stop walking, but we have to find out. So, what does impairment mean? It is the intensity and frequency of asthma symptoms and the degree to which the patient's symptoms are limited. So, every time you come to the end, it's going to be the same redundant questions every time you come. It's going to be because sometimes you don't realize. It's like, so how are you doing? I'm feeling good. I have had no shortness of breath. When was the last time you went shopping? Well, you know, last time on Mother's Day, all my kids were here. I said, I don't feel like I feel short of breath, right? So you are symptomatic. Those are the questions. So freedom from frequent troublesome symptoms of asthma. Are you missing work? Since all of you are beyond that, most of you are beyond the working age group, are you missing family reunions? Are you missing, I, I don't want to go to church because everybody looks at me when I cough. Okay, now that's not the reason you don't go to the church. You come to me, tell me why you're coughing. I'll, fig I'll try to figure it out. And it turns out you have a disease where you have to cough. I'll, I'll give you something for the church. I'll say half an hour before church, take this pill and you won't cough. <coughs> okay? So, nighttime awakening is very important. You need, to have a sta you need to have a restful sleep. If you're waking up in the night, sign of bad asthma control. And optimization of lung function. I'll skip the pediatric part. Work, school. Gone other days, who cares, right? Then the reduce risk. That's the most important part, is reducing the risk. The goal of asthma. You know, I work in ICU, and oftentimes I tell the nurses something, and they say, why are you doing this? And I tell them, this is preventive. We have to be as, 
as long as we can be a step ahead of the disease. So if you're going to, you know, we drive from um, here to Arizona, okay, as one of my patient's family. And that's why, again, thank them because they tell me about beautiful places. So I say, so you go through Erie? Yes, I go through Erie. And you get worse there? Actually, yes, I, I asked my wife to drive. I said, do you realize that your oxygen goes down because it's such an elevation? I never thought of it because he goes like, turns out, you know, he's been low oxygen all the time when he goes over passes. So it's amazing that her, the husband is talking and he goes over the passes, <laughs> then he's back up and they think she's sleeping when it's actually low oxygen. <laughs> so it's prevention. Now to prevent that, it's, it's easier he sleeps, right? But we have to prevent that because that in long term is going to harm him. So prevention is like this gentleman very, very correctly said is forming, there should be no shame in carrying your inhaler. There is, should be no shame in using your oxygen. There is no shame because I can do my part of giving you the inhalers. You have to follow it up by using them correctly. And if you don't like it, you know, none of these inhalers, the picture I showed, none of them are our personal choices. <coughs> you know, if you have cost issues, if you have, you have to discuss that with the physician. You have side effects, discuss that with the, and you know, weird side effect. Let's say you have, you know, I dream of my long lost friend when I take this inhaler and only when I take this inhaler. You know, I would say, just stop it for three days, see what happens if the dream go away. Maybe it was not because of, it was because of the inhaler. Now you say, I stopped using the inhalers and the dreams went away. I said, why don't you start taking them again? See the dreams come back. You start taking it, the dreams never came back. Okay, let's continue the inhaler. We'll figure it out when the dream comes back. So it is very important that you have to maintain the compliance and we use that because remember, every time you have an asthma attack, you're helping your lungs build strong muscles. And when they form strong muscles, so by, by the time people of reach your age, you have already developed COPD. And you say, how can I get COPD when I've never smoked? It's because the asthma during that time, when you say, when I was small, I used to go to, oh, my mom used to always keep me in the hospital. Oh yeah, my mom, in fact, some people are so scared, they say, oh, you're gonna put me in the lung ward. I said, we don't have lung wards anymore. Yeah, right, you don't have lung wards anymore. And then I'm going to get TB from somewhere. I said, no, we don't have lung wards. It's because they have had asthma forever. Now they have developed these, um, these thick, uh, air, um, the airway has become what is called as remodeling that you cannot do anything. The inhalers, they essentially stop working. So majority of the medical visits of asthma are for urgent care. Effective asthma management comes from proactive, preventive approach. All my patients, when I have a talk with them, I have a, I have, they know when their disease gets worse. Springtime is worse for me, fall is worse for me, okay? Different pollens. Winters are worse for me because cold air is a stimulus for some. And then, so you have extrinsic, which is from allergies, intrinsic, which is from cold air or irritants. So they know when the weather is going to be cold, so symptoms, so that is prevention, that's your. Smart people, they know exactly what to do. They find out, okay, this is happening. Okay, I know, I don't even know the name of those trees they tell me. I just trust them, I say, yeah. When they tell me, you know, when that one blooms in my neighbor's house, I'm in trouble. But they know that they won't go out. They will take the other way to go out because they know that tree is blooming. So um, routine visits, every six months to a year, you know, sometimes people think that uh, we let them off, which is, you know, a, a term when we say, you know what, you don't need me, you're good, you're, you're stable, you don't need follow-ups. So COPD is something which is more consistent. Asthma is back and forth, COPD is one, you always have symptoms of shortness of breath. You need the inhalers. There is, no, there is no time when you feel better and it's usually related to smoking. Um, we'll skip that. This is the asthma action plan, uh, you know, for new asthmatics, giving you the, 
we are giving you the, the, the freedom of changing and managing your, uh, your medications. You have the peak flow. Usually we use it for people who have asthma for a long time because you know what your good and what your bad is. And these are, you know, mainly for, and these are our combinations, you know. Uh, we'll skip that. I'm skipping because I, I know we need time for nutrition and uh, because that's very important. Asthma COPD overlap is the is the other thing which now ev now people come and ask me. So what do I have? Do I have asthma or do I have COPD, right? Um, and often based on how the patient's mood is, if the patient's mood is good, they are happy. I can crack a joke. I can say, don't worry about treatment. Is same at this point. Don't go into details of asthma or COPD. But if they really want to go into the detail, then we can say, you know what, yes. Yeah, so this is called as asthma COPD overlap. What it means is either you are one of those asthmatics who has had asthma for a long time and now you have had fixed changes of COPD or you are somebody like yourself who, don't, who doesn't <coughs> smoke but then, um, or uh, like somebody who, who has propensity to have asthma and they start smoking, right? So then you have asthma and, and the only difference is the treatment for COPD and asthma differs in the use of the inhaled steroids. Inhaled steroids for inflammation, number one, we have to treat for anybody with asthma. When it comes to COPD, we only use inhaled steroids for somebody whose lung function is less than 50% and has two exacerbations requiring steroids in the last two years. Because you know, when you give inhaled steroid, it decreases the immunity and the chances of pneumonia do go up. So not everybody with COPD needs to be on all three inhalers. And that's what the packet comes. So we wish we had, so COPD is a group of illness which has a fixed airway obstruction. It has to be fixed. There should be no change. Like asthma, if I test you today, your lung function test may be normal. When you're having an attack and I check you, you will have abnormal, uh, you will have the airway showing tight. What we see is how fast you can exhale air in one second. Is the, is the pulmonary function test we do. So if you have a fixed obstruction, you are called as somebody with COPD. If you have a normal lung function which responds to albuterol, that goes in favor of asthma. So it's a chronic destruction of airway with a component of inflammation. Asthma is all inflammation and eventually it leads to airway destruction if not treated appropriately. So, changes in the lung, you have changes in the airway. Sir? I forgot to mention that I had asthma before I had COPD, and I, I, I had reflux so bad so many times, that's probably what led up to my COPD, as it turns out. That's good. I, that's had, I had Barrett's esophagus for cancer, and uh, two years after my cancer surgery, COPD. So, so what you're saying is that ties right together. So we have the problems in the airway, then the lung parenchyma, and the blood vessels. So starting from airways, which was my talk, going to lung parenchyma, that was Dr. Kunanan's talk, and blood vessels, that was Dr. Caetano's talk. So all three can be involved and are usually involved. That's my home uh, country. Uh, that's very common when people come from people who have not been exposed to the killer fog. That's the other killer fog we have, which is, you know, people from Mexico when they come in and I ask them usually, when did you come? Oh, I've been in America for a lot of years. Okay, how many years? 10 years. Where were you born in this part of Mexico? What did you use to cook? Wood. 
And then I started asking the same question for people here because up in the mountains they use wood for heating and they have never smoked and they have all the changes which you have and you can imagine you know after you have a barbecue you smell like smoke for all day right those are particulates which are getting stuck and you can imagine that happening to your to your uh, uh, lungs so you have second hand exposure biomass exposure and these are some symptoms so i always you know when i'm shaking hands i'm moving them around i look for marks of cigarette smoking you can see the nicotine uh, you see clubbing you know that's your fingers because of chronic low oxygen if you see any of your friends with that that is never normal uh, there are very few uh, patients of con i mean you can have congenital clubbing but if you see fingers like drumstick you know you just tell them to go and find you know a pulmonologist talk to primary care um, these are the two phenotypes you have the pink puffers and the blue bloaters pink puffers usually have emphysema and blue bloaters are you see the pink puffer is with you know uh, with the uh, with the issues with um, the destruction of the parenchyma and blue bloaters have mainly the bronchitis issues they are blue because they retain carbon dioxide the emphysema they are pink because their oxygen is is completely normal so when when somebody comes in you can have you can just by looking at the person you can say oh he's going to have predominant emphysema or predominant uh, uh, bronchitis history physical exam you know you guys have been through all complete lung function test i know you all hate it um, uh, it is it is something frustrating especially when they are going go 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 but that's what they have to do because they have to make sure you give the best effort otherwise the test is is useless um, x-ray cat scan as needed so smoking cessation bronchodilators we use short acting which is called as rescue inhaler always keep it with you never in the truck you know that's like when is, where is your inhaler it's in the truck always keep it with you it's a rescue you know if you have a gun uh, and you're you're traveling in a jungle where you're scared of lions you never leave the gun in the truck always carry because when the lion you say hold on let me rush to my truck right uh, reflumilast is daliresp uh, if you have history of chronic bronchitis you may be on this medication uh, uh, you know we use it to prevent exacerbations for anybody who has more frequent exacerbations theophylline uh, specifically wrote that because you know uh, the people with asthma uh, when you know back in you know early 90 early 60s or 50s they used to give theophylline uh, people are still on it I never take it out because they have been using it for many years you know a old patient is better than a good doctor so don't mess around don't rock the boat NIV is something non-invasive ventilation you remember the guys blue bloaters what happens is during the day they can compensate for breathing so when they need <laughs> like that so when the carbon dioxide is going up the brain tells them breathe and they breathe fast right but when they're sleeping everything is shut down so they're sleeping calm so when they wake up they feel groggy why because they were not breathing well the carbon dioxide level went up so we have set criterias and we put them on non-invasive ventilator you can tolerate it you cannot tolerate it if you like it it works beautiful what we do is we take over the ventilation overnight so we put a mask and you just go to bed and you sleep with it your carbon dioxide goes down in the morning your your your, your muscles are all rested because you're you're not as drunk as you were without the machine and last is oxygen and i'm not going to add a single more word on oxygen than the gentleman has already referred Okay, I wish I could make a video and every time somebody comes with oxygen, I could put it in and show it to them. Um, we could go on and on and on, on on COPD and asthma, but as I said, if if you have any particular questions or concerns, 